Hello and welcome to Carnivorous Chats. My name is James, your host. I started this podcast to help other folks share their own healing stories and to interview thought leaders and experts in the carnivore, keto, and low oxalate space. Before we begin, I'd like to give a shout out to Equip Foods and the Carnivore Bar. As an affiliate, you can use the link in the show notes to get a discount on their products when you check out using the code Carnivorous. Thanks in advance for listening, subscribing, and any likes or shares. And now, on with the podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Carnivorous Chats. It's season three. And folks, you may look at the calendar now and say it's October. However, it's December for me because Christmas has come. As I said, the last episode I did with Monique, for me early, I've had three Christmases this year. I'm spoiled. I have the Low Ox coach, Monique Hattinger, returning for another Q&A episode. Monique, welcome back. So great to see you. Oh, thanks for having me, James. This is great. Um, have enjoyed every session that we've done. I'm sure I'm going to enjoy this one too. <laughs> me as well. And Monique, I have to tell you, and I'm, we mentioned just a second ago off air that our sort of series that we've started here has been such a joy, not only to record with you and to have so many pennies drop for me along our conversation, but clearly it's resonating with my audience. So I want to say thank you again for taking the time out and, and taking the time to answer these folks questions, because it's so important to have this information out there for folks that may be suffering. And maybe as I often talk about realizing that oxalates and salicylates as we're going to talk about and histamine is a big part of their journey it's so helpful to have these things so thank you again for me this was life-changing getting my diet right was life-changing and you know exponentially life-changing and i think we've we've talked about this before but i used to be a business consultant i was working in the it world while i was always a bit of a nutrition geek it was certainly not on my radar for this to be my life's work but this is my life's work this is what i want people to know that they can be healthy and it doesn't have to be you know, one miserable day after another, it can be, life can be a joy. You can have energy, you can be doing things. And that's, that's really, that's what I really appreciate about being able to talk to folks like you is that I can get that word out as bad as it might be right now. It may be that if we get your diet right, you can have a whole new, a whole new life. I absolutely love it. And thank you so much for everything you do in this space. With that being said, Monique, let's jump right in. Our last episode, the Q&A was so great. And I knew there was going to be an opportunity to really even go further. We talked about oxalates in, in a general sense in our first episode. Then we went into a Q&A episode where there was more specifics and we uncovered a lot, especially about histamine in that last episode, which was great. So helpful to so many people. I'd like to start this chat today with a question of my own because it affected me early on. And that's about another dear friend from the plant kingdom, our friend salicylates. And what is a salicylate? What does it do to us? And what do the plants use it for? Please, if you could just give the listeners a little background and info on that. The thing about salicylate is that it and oxalate can be a two for one problem for us. And part of the reason why I believe that many people are starting to have more salicylate issues could actually have to do with high oxalate in their diet. The reason for that is that salicylate is actually a phenol. This is a class of chemicals in plants. They're being used for all sorts of things. I didn't dig into that the same way that I've dug into oxalate in terms of how the plants are actually using them. But I will say that they are very common, particularly in fruits. So if you're trying to avoid salicylate, fruit is not your friend. Now, why would oxalate issues and salicylate issues run together? The biggest thing here is that oxalate can be trafficked into the liver. So your cell transporters in the liver, I always do the little hand sign because the cell transporters like this little thing comes out of the cell to get a nutrient. When the cell transporter looking for sulfate exits the cell, tries to pick up a sulfate molecule and pull it back in, that cell transporter is also able to move oxalate. So whatever the little ending is here that allows it to pick up a molecule, it'll allow it to pick up oxalate. And our cell transporters 
have essentially evolved in an environment where oxalate was a byproduct of our metabolism. So it was inside the cell and they were going to move it out. The nutrients were outside the cell and they were going to move them in. Well, what about when the anti-nutrients outside the cell? So it's almost like mistaken identity that it pulls oxalate into the cell. So in the case of the liver, if it's picking up oxalate and that's disrupting processes, part of the processes that are being disrupted are detox processes. And salicylates need to be detoxed by the liver for our bodies to handle them. So if we're eating a high salicylate diet, but our liver bandwidth is doing this, then all of a sudden we have too much salicylate circulating in the body and it can act in a number of unhelpful ways for us. So not just the salicylate itself, but also salicylate, it turns out, can act as a mast cell irritant as well and set off mast cells. So you, you can get these symptoms with salicylate that might even look a bit like histamine, like red faces or red ears, but salicylate sets off things that are also somewhat specific. So not these generic things that might look like mast cells or histamine. So tinnitus, really bad tinnitus is one of the things that you see with salicylate toxicity. It's actually one of the ways that they diagnose people who have ended up with salicylate toxicity because they took aspirin because aspirin is salicylic acid. It's the acid here. So most people find that they have a salicylate issue because they took aspirin for something and bad things started happening, like their ears started ringing or their faces got red. Or um, So oxalate is a player here, not because it's directly making salicylate or like people start to make logical leaps for us as humans, which don't correspond to our biochemistry. So the issue with oxalate and salicylate is that oxalate disrupts your detox. So you're not getting rid of the salicylate quickly enough. It's building up in your system. And then it's this salicylate that's circulating in the bloodstream that's messing you up, impacting mast cells, maybe kicking off histamine for the mast cells, but doing these other things like red faces, red ears, mood dysregulation, um, Kids who have problems with salicylate can get really silly or dopey or almost like they're drunk sometimes. So you can get these really sort of odd symptoms that you wouldn't link together. But the one where if you took aspirin and this happened, that's salicylate. That that would be a way for you to be able to determine, oh yeah, that's what my problem is. Very interesting. Specifically for me, cluing into, I, mean, I should have clued into that, but I had the brain fog state that was a high oxalate diet, right. the aspirin thing, because many, I was so oxalate toxic. I was in pain throughout my body. You know, as we talked about prior in episodes that I was really arthritic. Um, my stomach was a mess and I was constantly also popping aspirin in the hopes that it would relieve me. And then the tinnitus would kick in for me. So I was exacerbating going in this hamster wheel as we dive into the audience questions, I'll ask them and remind them, and I will put the links in the show notes to our first two episodes, because some of these questions tie into things that we've discussed before in our prior episodes. And the first one is, and we talked about this in our first episode together, is people that have oxalate toxicity and are trying to balance their minerals. But some folks begin to feel worse. Is it common to feel worse when trying to balance your minerals and taking a B complex, excuse me? If you're trying to tackle minerals and B vitamins at the same time, then you probably shouldn't. The problem there is that B vitamins tend to provide the body with nutrients where it can do more work. And particularly B6 is implicated in the production of oxalate in the body. So if you start taking more B6, you can be slowing down some of your oxalate production, which is good but you can also then be stimulating more oxalate to move out of the cells because production's coming down. Like some of these things are kind of nuancy things. So what I would say is I didn't start with B vitamins and I would recommend most anyone, especially if you're going to try and do this on your own, that you do not start with B vitamins until after you have sorted out your minerals. 
And for most people, the first mineral to start with is magnesium. It's one of the most plentiful in the body. And if oxalate is going to do its regular thing, which is chelate a mineral as part of its normal function as a chelator, it's looking to balance out its, its charge. So it's double negative. It's looking for a double positive. If you serve it up magnesium, that's easier for the kidneys to deal with. It's easier for the body to deal with. It's less toxic. So if it meets up with a magnesium molecule, that's good. So having abundant magnesium in your body can be good. Now, everybody's got to kind of like walk this sort of fine line trajectory because too much magnesium and you could end up with diarrhea. That's not helpful especially if you're trying to balance out minerals and electrolytes. So um, I actually started with like a CalMag, which was an easy place to start. And you need calcium as well. Oxalate can be affecting calcium. You need to be a little more careful with the calcium aspect of it. If you've got kidney stones or you're you're arthritic or you've got something where, where crystallization can be affecting you. You would definitely want to make sure you're taking your D and K someplace so that the calcium is going where you want it to, not where you don't want it to. But that's, I really started with basics, like magnesium first, and then trying to do a CalMag. And then we did a low dose multi-mineral, but even some of these can be kind of nuanced moves. If you're, if you're dealing with histamine at the same time, you don't necessarily want to be taking citrate forms because some people don't handle citrate forms so truth be told this is just i wish i could simplify it more i wish i had like a, a client profile where i could say if you've got this do this right so if somebody wanted to do this on their own minerals first probably the the best way to handle minerals would be the simplest formulation possible. Less additives, not a lot of other stuff added to the capsule. So single minerals and simple as possible. I, I actually work with a lot of um, products where I've got like a, a mineral ion and water and that's all that's in it. So that makes a lot of sense because then you're not confused about whether or not you are reacting to the mineral or you're reacting to the additives or you're reacting to the capsule or because some of us can be so sensitive, we can be reacting to even very small components of something that we're taking. So it it is a bit nuanced. Um, it can help to work with somebody with some of this, especially if you're feeling brain fogged. But it's not impossible to do it on your own because back in the day, I was not a nutritionist and I did it on my own. But slow, steady, careful, one at a time. And most people, that's where it gets really frustrating and miserable for them. It's slow and steady and one at a time is not the answer anybody wants. So, um, but that's that's really... I would absolutely do minerals first. And then I would build my bridges towards things like B vitamins. So if you're trying to take like a B complex and a bunch of minerals and do it all at once, we have no idea what your body's reacting to. We just have no idea. And we don't know if, if part of it is you're just getting too much of a good thing. Like maybe you would do fine on B6 or B1 if it was a smaller amount, but it's all in one capsule. And so we can't, there's just, there's so much you can't tell there. Such great advice. Thank you, Monique. And this next question ties directly into this because folks are then going, okay, I'm looking to supplement with certain things. I'm trying to eat certain foods. Uh, there was a question that was asked, about oxalate data on foods and supplements, for example. How do we know what the oxalate content of a supplement would be or certain foods like jackfruit and chlorella, which I know chlorella is used quite a bit in the detoxing world um, in a sort of functional medicine as, as something that can help. So where do folks go that are having all these questions? What's the best advice you could give them? The only place I know of which tries to collate all the information that's published together in one place is the Triangle Oxalates Group. It's the only one I know of. 
And um, that's the only group that I know of, which is actively testing all kinds of things, like not just individual foods, but you know, there, there are people who are needing to be gluten-free and they want a gluten-free alternative for something, or like we end up testing all kinds of things because people who join the group are allowed to sponsor something to test. So if your family's favorite cookie has to be on the list, you can, you can actually sponsor that, get it tested. Um, 60 bucks us. It's a pretty good deal. So like there, that's the only group I know of where they're actually actively testing, still testing foods that have been tested before, which is another thing because different tests show different results for the same food. This drives people crazy, but honestly, once you're not brain fogged anymore and you can do an average, then you can, you can have a better idea of what that food is doing or if you start to see enough data where you get a cluster of the data so that you know oh this is generally low we might have some crazy outliers but i'm not going to kill myself with one instance with a crazy outlier so yeah again it's like people would love a black and white answer here gosh i would love to give them a black and white answer here but i'm going to use um calorie counts as an analogy calorie counts do not give you the calories in the individual apple, for instance, which is sitting in front of you. They give you an average of who knows how many tests done of apples, right? They don't necessarily give you the calories in a gala apple versus a Granny Smith apple versus a Honeycrisp apple versus a, they give you the calorie count for an apple, right? We've done enough tests with calories that we've got a pretty solid average for what the calories in an apple would be. But that, but that doesn't tell you about the one that's in front of you. And, you know, if you had a super sweet tree and a perfect growing season, maybe your apples got a lot more calories than the apple that the average that they've given. So it's a bit like this with oxalate, like, because I've seen different professionals using different numbers for foods and this makes people crazy. And I completely understand why, but the problem is until we have enough test data that we can say, Oh, on average, rutabagas have this much oxalate in say 100 grams, right? We're we're all going to be doing our best to bias in the right direction. So that's what I tell people to do. If you know that you generally want to head north, if the road you're on does this, but then it's going to head north again, then you're good, right? So it's like biasing in the right direction. It's not, I'm going to be able to do this perfectly. There just isn't any way to do this perfectly. You head in the right direction, you tend towards the foods, which tend to be lower oxalate, and it will work out. It's just, there's no way to, to do it perfectly. This is the last question related to the foods before we move on to body specific symptoms associated with oxalate toxicity. And this one we kind of covered in both of our previous episodes, but it's a good question because it ties into what we're just talking about. And the question was, should higher oxalate foods like cacao, I know one of our favorites, and turmeric be eliminated, or are they okay to have on occasion? I know this is very nuanced, but I'll let you speak to it, Monique. And I think it's a reasonable question because people have favorite foods. If I'm going to succumb to something, I'm going to succumb to chocolate. <laughs> it's like, I'm sorry. I'm I am mostly carnivore 99% of the time, but there's that occasion. Anyway. <laughs> So serving size matters. Some foods are just so high oxalate that the serving size that would work is so tiny, it's not worth the effort. So a great example would be almonds. There's a, like three to four milligrams of oxalate per gram of almond. So your itty bitty little almond in your hand could already be 10 milligrams of oxalate. 
that's not worth it, right? That's not worth it. Now, if you're talking about something like chocolate, is there a way to work there? Maybe. Probably wouldn't be cacao because cacao is one of those things which is so high oxalate in its raw state that I would not touch it with a 10 foot pole. And I eat other chocolate. So it's not that I'm a chocolate phobic. And turmeric, like a teaspoon of turmeric, didn't I look this up recently? Is like, you know, 50, 70 milligrams. It's like, it's up there. And so how tiny would the serving have to be for it to be reasonable within the context of a meal, right? Or, you know, I, I don't think people do this sort of cost benefit thinking, but it's really down to that. Now, could you could you include turmeric in the form of curcumin? That's a whole different ball game with some of these things. Like the extract from turmeric, which I use when I cook. I have bulk curcumin powder, which I could take as a supplement, but I use it for cooking. That's a fraction of the oxalate that's in turmeric. So if you happen to be somebody who is really hooked on golden milk, Lord love you, then use the curcumin powder. Do not use turmeric. I would never use turmeric. There's, there, to me, the, the trade-off for the amount of oxalate for the small amount that you'd be able to use in a drink like that and then be able to have your meal or whatever. Like, Because I'm really thinking... Low oxalate, 40 to 60 milligrams per day. Medium oxalate, 61 to 100 milligrams a day. Like one golden milk is already taking you way past your 100. So, it, you know, I just wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. But I, I, I've absolutely hacked a recipe for golden milk so that people can have it if they want to. Because curcumin's got anti-inflammatory, you know, decent research on it. So with cacao... Yeah, I would go to cocoa rather than cacao. That brings down the amount of oxalate in it a fair bit. Not enough for you to have a lot of it. Um, and I would have it as um, as a milk chocolate or a small component of a bigger dish. Like occasionally we will use something like a chocolate drizzle on a vanilla ice cream. Um, so that... If you want some of the taste, if that's important enough to you, you can get it. But let's do it in a way where you're not going to harm yourself with the inflammatory level of oxalate that's present. You know, when people say to me, well, I really, you know, I really love, oh, what's another high oxalate thing that people love? Some people love spinach. They really do. But I, but I think there's, you know, Again, it's like, let's go for something which tastes like spinach, functions like spinach, and but you're not getting all that oxalate. So in our case, um, my grandmother used to make, my Swiss grandmother liked spinach, she used to make things with spinach. And we used to have something called rusty, which is a potato dish. Yeah, there's got to be enough oxalate in there to take down a bull moose because you use raw potato to make it. And so I subbed in cauliflower for the potato component and saute it and butter and do all the things that my Swiss grandmother would do, but do it to cauliflower instead. And then my grandmother would then layer spinach on top of that and then a slice of ham and an egg. Like it's kind of a nice way to have like a breakfasty kind of food. So instead of spinach, I would use steamed radish greens of all the greens that I've tried it tastes the closest fraction of the oxalate so I would encourage people to if they're foodies if they're really foodies because some people are and they don't want to you know leave some of these foods behind then work with some of the alternatives see see what you find because yeah some of these foods are not worth it and that is the beauty of this is that you can find alternatives. And as Monique said, she has found these and can suggest them to you. And folks, you don't have to give up things that you love. You just have to make simple substitutions as we talked about in our first episode. 
Monique, as we move on, this next one is an, an interesting one because for folks that follow me, I just had a very great discussion with Dr. Anthony Chafee, and this issue came up as well with him. And I was pleased to hear Dr. Chafee mention that. And the specific question is, what is the connection between gout and uric acid and oxalate? I wish there was more research that actually connected the dots here. What I can say is after having more than 60,000 people go through the doors, the virtual doors of the trying low oxalates groups, Lots of them will deal with gout as part of the challenge while they're getting oxalate out of their body. So I'm suspicious of a couple of things. One of the things I'm suspicious of is the impact of oxalate on the kidneys. So what if in the process of getting rid of oxalate, we're having some issues with uric acid building up because the perhaps the kidneys preferentially move oxalate under certain circumstances. Like there's so many, again, sort of pieces here where I'm not sure that we know enough, but the research does clearly show that if you have kidney stones, you're more likely to end up with gout. So there's some kind of an association there. I just don't know in which direction, um, who precedes uh, or that we know enough yet to say for sure, oh yes, if you're moving out oxalate, this is something to watch for. But based on uh, reports from members on the Triangle Oxalates group, I would definitely have my radar going. Um, I have run into gout twice myself. It was not fun. <laughs> Um, and pseudo gout's not as bad. Pseudo gout, you don't have the the level of pain. I had real, live, genuine gout once, and it was after I had um, I had been eating uh, liver every week for three or four weeks, and then all of a sudden, and it was a thumb joint. So we usually think about it with toes, but you can get it in fingers too. And I've never had pain like that. I couldn't have the sheets from our bed over my hand. Like I just couldn't deal with anything, even barely brushing this thumb. And so I'm, I'm definitely convinced there's, there's something going on there, but again, is it, it, we don't know the mechanism. What I can't tell you is the mechanism for the, for that connection. This next question, Monique, is one that often also gets asked as well. Now, I know from my limited understanding that it's a favorite haunting place or hiding place for oxalates, and that is how does oxalate affect the thyroid? Well, it, again, we're. I think what we're starting to understand is that certain cell transporters are going to be able to move oxalate as well as a nutrient. So with the thyroid, we have chloride transporters, I believe, um, and they can also uh, move oxalate. And so we have this situation again, where you have a tissue which is going out to find a nutrient and it can normally take oxalate as a byproduct of its work and get rid of it and then pull a nutrient in, but as soon as you've got a bloodstream where you've got a higher than usual uh, concentration of oxalate in there, then you've got an opportunity for that cell transporter to basically work in reverse. It's pulling the anti-nutrient in. And with the thyroid, there was research that was done. And it was done uh, with thyroids from people who had passed away and their bodies had been donated. And so this was harvested tissue from people who had passed away, all different ages. So they had they had everything from small children, unfortunately, right through to the very elderly. Very quickly in this research, they report just realizing that they could tell the age of the person where they had the harvested thyroid tissue from by how much oxalate was in those thyroids. So they could tell the difference right away from looking at a young person's thyroid versus an old person's thyroid. And I thought that's really telling. 
So there's something there for sure, which we should be paying more attention to, especially with the epidemic of people on thyroid meds. Like, I don't know about you, but I can name you off like 10 or more people who are on thyroid meds. Seriously? Were people always on thyroid meds like this, right? No, they weren't. So something's not right that we're all turning up this way. Now, there's so many things going on in diet and so on. There, it's a bit of a perfect storm. How do you determine which aspect of diet or environment or whatever could be the problem? But with this one, there is this, this research link, I should get it to you, which shows that they could predict the age of the person based on the thyroid tissue sample that they had. And that's that's pretty telling that it's accumulating. It's accumulating over time. And, you know, we are, we are seeing all this problem with the thyroid. So interestingly enough, this is one of those places where I stumbled into something by accident because the, the thyroid needs chloride, but because the thyroid also needs magnesium, it actually needs magnesium to convert T4 to T3. Um, it turns out that just using something like a magnesium chloride solution, which is normally called mag oil, magnesium oil over your thyroid can really help people have better thyroid function. And I was in the process of my endocrine guy putting me on thyroid meds when I had started to do minerals for oxalate, right? And one of the things I decided to do because I didn't want to stress my gut all the time was use magnesium chloride solution on my skin. But it was, um, it irritated my skin a bit. It made my skin a bit itchy. So I was tending to use it underneath my clothes because I found if the skin wasn't exposed to air, it was better. And then one day I had some left on my hands and I, my kids were still young and I was trying to get ready. It's just frustrated. And I just got rid of it on my throat. And then Later that day, I was like, I'm not cold. I'm not tired. <laughs> so very long story short, started using it. And when I would feel like I was feeling cold or I was feeling like my energy was flagging, would use it again and found an aloe-based moisturizer or something to help with any irritation and to carry it into the skin better. So it's not laying on the top of the skin and then causing that dryness and the irritation. So got back to my endocrine guy and he said, well, the medication's working. Your numbers are better than they've ever been. And I went, not taking it. <laughs> He's like, what? So I'm using this magnesium oil over my throat. He said, well, I don't know why it's working, but keep doing it. And I think why it works is that you're actually addressing then thyroid's need for some nutrients to be able to do its work. And that allows the tissues to have more energy because they're getting their work done. They're able to get rid of some of the oxalate that's on board, right? Like, cause oxalate is a process of secretion. Once you've got oxalate inside a cell, it's got a, it, it, it uses a cell transporter to get it out. It's not a passive leaves the cell on its own. So the cell needs to have enough energy in order to get rid of oxalate. So there's a lot of things to unpack with some of this, but being able to provide it with some magnesium, provide it with some chloride, nutrients, it needs to do its work. And as close to direct delivery as possible, if you're putting it right here, just made a world of difference. So does the thyroid struggle with oxalate? Yes, it does. Are, are there an awful lot of people who have thyroid issues? Yeah. Does the research show that it accumulates over time in there? Yeah. And this is one of those places where a simple, a simple thing can, can help you get better function out of your thyroid and hopefully get it uh, working better for you so that you're not having to be on either as much meds or maybe like me, not, not any meds. Simple solutions. And especially for those folks that struggle either taking pills if they wanted to take magnesium or can't or having reactions, topical stuff, 
love it. Our, our skin is our biggest organ, literally. So anything we can get topically that will provide a simple solution, fantastic. This next one was a great question, and I'm anxious to hear the answer to this one because having been someone that consumed a ton of oxalates and definitely suffered because of it, I am interested to find out the answer because the question is, how does connective tissue repair after years of high oxalate eating? And can it repair, Monique? I'm going to argue yes. Like this is one of those things like uh, like your Anthony Chafee episode where he was talking about people getting kidney function back. We didn't think these things happened, right? We thought once you went down the road to loss of kidney function, that was it. You were done. Um, and he's not the only one talking about this because I saw somebody else who was talking about getting kidney function back. It might have been Jason Fung, who through he's a fasting guy. He was getting diabetics off their medications and getting them off dialysis as well. So you know, I think people have this idea about connective tissue the same way we had this idea about kidney tissue, that it was somehow those tissues don't regenerate properly. So I'm going to say I'm not sure about that because I, I suspect that we think that connective tissue may not regenerate, but it may be a matter of what are you feeding the system? If you're feeding that body with food, which is adulterated with something that's pro-inflammatory, can it regenerate tissue well? And I'd argue maybe not. So when it comes to connective tissue, it remodels like every other tissue in the body. Even your bones remodel, right? They take, they're very slow. It takes a long time. But that's another one where in the carnivore world, We've, we're seeing people reverse osteoporosis. Again, we weren't supposed to see that. Like once that bone was gone, it was supposed to be gone. So I don't, I can't point to any particular research that would back me up on this. It's a hypothesis I'm, I'm currently working with. But if somebody eats enough, good quality protein. And I don't advocate like collagen supplements and all that kind of stuff. Get your, get your collagen, get your different forms of protein molecules in a whole food. But if they do that, could they be regenerating connective tissue? I'd argue, I think it's possible. Now, in my own experience, uh, and I uh, have sort of subclinical hypermobility. So I don't have, I don't have something where somebody diagnosed me, but I do have joints that go more than 90 degrees. And I have some, some, some little funky things like this. <laughs> so I have some issue with hypermobility and I demolished my left ankle so many times. I don't know why it was always the left one, but I was told at one point I should probably have surgery. I said no. Uh, and that ankle was unstable for most of my life. I wish I had scans or something where I could prove. But now I'm in my 60s and that foot used to spontaneously roll. Like I just, I would, I could sprain my ankle at the drop of a hat. I could be walking on flat ground and all of a sudden go down. I haven't done that in years. Uh... I don't know. We're going to have to leave that one for people to mull over a little bit. But but if but if we're seeing other places where if we do the right things from a nutritional standpoint that we actually get regeneration of tissues that we thought we couldn't. Maybe that's possible here too. Yeah, I look forward to more information coming out about that, but certainly the signs are there that things should be able to to heal. So I appreciate that response, Monique. This next one, again, I, I would imagine is very nuanced and will be sort of open-ended in that there's still research to come. But for those folks that are going through the depths of it, and I'm talking about oxalate toxicity, histamine intolerance, gut imbalance, they've got it all. The question was, can this fade with time? And how does one stabilize mast cell activation syndrome and treat gut issues like candida? Is 
This is a huge question, I know, but is is there hope for folks out there, Monique? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think what we have to keep in mind here is what you feed the body is not just fuel. It's replacement parts for your body. And we don't think about it that way. We think about it as fuel, but you're not a car. You're an independently mobile manufacturing facility with more complicated emotions. <laughs> it's kind of like that. <laughs> and within that context, there are certain parts of us that are more responsive to immediate conditions, one of which is the gut and the gut microbiome. So what you're feeding yourself is also dictating how that gut's going to swing and what things it's going to consider to be more important. So if, if we've swung towards a really high oxalate diet, our gut right now is preferentially trying to deal with that as their replacement parts, their fuel source. And as we move to a different approach where that's not a big component of what's coming in, then the gut tends to shift as well. So does that mean there's no room for us to do something with probiotics or whatever? Mm, no, I'm not saying that, but I would, I personally will want to wait until I've got somebody stabilized and feeling at least relatively good before we play with probiotics, because I don't want to shift that gut too quickly. It's got to continue to deal with oxalate, which may be secreted back into the gut for disposition. The kidneys isn't, are not the only organs that deal with oxalate. We can be um, sweating it out through our skin. We can be moving it out through mucous membranes. Where you see secretion, we could have oxalate as part of what's being secreted, and we can secrete that stuff back into the gut. So we want to kind of let the gut be as flexible as possible, if you will. But part of what happens as we increase our oxalate is we disrupt the conversation between our immune system and the gut microbiome is that conversation depends on biotin. And as our, our conversation with the gut becomes muted because there's not enough biotin, oxalates directly disrupting that. So those enzymes aren't being built. Candida kind of takes the lead and goes, oh, there's lots of oxalate here. So I have to do things. People think it's that oxalate feeds candida or that candida makes oxalate. And that's not, it's, it's really not as direct as that. It's more that oxalate acts as an excitatory to the candida and makes them go, ooh, there's things I have to be doing here. And the candida is going to take advantage of what maybe the other bacteria are producing. It's not, it's not eating oxalate, it's not making oxalate. It's responding to what else is happening in the gut microbiome. And if we've muted Monique's immune system so that the, I, I'm not talking to the gut, then it's doing things without the kind of conversation that should be present there, which is what would normally be the situation. So um, like, it's not so much fade. It's a new balance that you come to over time. Um, and that's completely separate from histamine intolerance and things like mast cell activation. That is not a fun acre to hoe, having hoed it myself. What you really need there is, again, a certain amount of patience with the process. Because once your immune system's all revved up here, you have to like bring it back down. And my current hypothesis on how th that you do that would include supplements and things like that, but also who sets the tone for the whole body. So if the immune system's running the show, you don't want the immune system running the show. They should be like 
supplementary to the body, taking care of the body in a support role, right? So you want to come up and over them. And the only way to do that is with your nervous system. So again, it's like we have to work with the checks and balances as they work in the body. So you need the vagus nerve back on. You need, because your gut's also being affected by the fact that the vagus nerve's not talking enough to it, right? Because that's vagus nerve comes out here, comes through here, enervates the entire abdomen. And like the mast cells are just doing the best job they can. They're like the guards at the gate. So if they're left without direction, and it sounds like the drums of war are going on elsewhere, then they're going to be firing at whoever's coming down the road. They're not waiting to, to ask them any questions, right? So it's, it, it again, we have to think of ourselves in not these isolated, like, segments. We have to kind of think about how it works as a whole. So you want to bring the immune system down. Sure, you want to support it. You want to give it the right nutrients, all that kind of stuff. But you want to make the nervous system do its proper job. It's supposed to set the tone for the whole system. And it's supposed to be in proper balance. Sympathetic nervous system is a really important part, but it should not be on all the time. It should be handing off to the parasympathetic. You know, mindset might be part of it. Like, people go through so much trauma as part of their experience of being ill. You may have all kinds of things there that you have to unwind. I, I end up talking to people about all those kinds of things. I end up talking to people about things like, uh, you know, different kinds of ways to stimulate your nervous system. So it's doing the work it's supposed to do. Um, I use an Apollo neuro myself. I had it on earlier today. I don't, I can't show you what it looks like, but I, I've got one because I found it was subtle, but it supported things. Doing meditation, getting exercise, getting sunshine. Like there's all these things which are not necessarily just what we feed ourselves this way, but it's still part of what's feeding this whole system. And in order to really get on top of certainly things like mast cell activation once you're at that level you really have to be coming at it physically emotionally intellectually spiritually you you can't really be you can't really just say i'm going to take a pill and it's going to be fixed because that one don't work that way i'm going to just hop around a little bit here and uh, just go into a, a, another question a listener asks had you ever experienced meat aversion or nausea with red meat in particular yourself. I know that folks sometimes struggle with red meat. I know that there's the tick bite with the alpha gal out there, but this is just an aversion. I have heard of folks that do have it to beef particularly. Yeah. I think that's a histamine thing, honestly. Um, if your histamine in your body's running too high, uh, and then you add a high histamine input, it may be taking you to this place where you can end up with things like nausea. And what tipped me off to this was gravol do you know what gravol is oh yes for anti-nausea <laughs> yeah it's an antihistamine when i looked sense. it up and i looked up the chemical and i did reading i went son of a gun you're an antihistamine so um you know i think that has something to do with why we can't do red meat sometimes and for me personally i cannot do beef all the time i will eat lamb i have much better tolerance for something like lamb because i push myself mostly through stress but into this histamine you know mast cell world and um you know, getting, crawling back from that meant that I had to start paying attention to the histamine that was in the meat I was eating. And honestly, I do much better with fresh chicken and pork and lamb and limited beef. And I don't see any reason why you can't do carnivore that way. And I certainly don't see any reason why somebody can't be a healthy omnivore that way. What you really need to keep in mind is, you know, where are you going to get your fat from? What's the quality of the meat? But truly, 
I, I don't think there's an advantage to forcing yourself to eating aged beef. If you can get your hands on unaged or some other ruminant meat, beautiful. But yeah, I, I've certainly had that I could not look beef in the face and had to do something else because I was just, I'd overstimulated my system. I, my histamine was running too high. I couldn't, I couldn't go there. You know, it's very interesting, Monique, because my my guest for the finale of season two was Dr. Ash Zarian, and he had exactly this. He had a big aversion to red meat, even though he tried like a, a demon to just eat the beef, as we we're told. But he settled like you on lamb, and it's exclusively what he eats. And he found that to be the biggest healing factor for him is when he dropped the beef and went to the lamb. And it's probably because of exactly that. Monique, this next one is again, a dietary one. What is the best way in your opinion to help the body break down the fats as we were talking about in the meat? And if we take supplements, do you have any that you suggest? I know there's a bunch of options here and I can chime in at the end. From my standpoint, if the issues fat malabsorption and issues with fat digestion, and that's very common among people who have had a high oxalate diet. Why? You're pulling in oxalate instead of sulfate. You're having a hard time building bile. That would be very common. And the bile that you are building could have oxalate in it because gallstones can be oxalate based. So I'm one of those people, I don't have a gallbladder. And everybody told me, oh my gosh, you're never going to be able to lose weight. You're never going to be able to eat high fat, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> None of that turned out to be true. Now, your body will adapt, but if you're having difficulties, it can be really helpful to do something like bile salts. That's a place to start. Usually it's ox bile that you'll find in a supplement. The problem with ox bile can be if you are really histamine sensitive, that could set you off a little bit. So, you know, try a product try to get something where it's as clean as possible, minimal additives, blah, 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 blah. But if that's not working for you, my next favorite is taurine, plain, ordinary, garden variety, powdered taurine. Tastes, to me, it doesn't taste like anything. I just take it in water. I don't even take it with a capsule. And the nice thing about taurine is that it's like raw material to build bile. So it's very helpful there, but it's doing other things as well. So I love this one because it's multifactorial. So taurine, there's research on taurine protecting the kidneys from the effects of oxalate, check. There's research on taurine operating in the body as an antioxidant, check. There's research on taurine helping you to relax and be able to more easily build serotonin and melatonin. And for a lot of us who are running in, you know, high stress, sympathetic nervous system all the time, that's another check, right? And a lot of people with oxalate issues have problems with sleep. So I'm a little suspicious there could be something disrupting some of that. So if you're getting some taurine, that can help with that. But it's essentially what your body uses to build bile. And so for a lot of people, this is all they'll need. They don't need to do anything fancy or high end. And personally, I would even take it after I'd had a meal and found that I wasn't quite digesting well. I would just put some in a glass of water, maybe not a whole glass, you know, but drink it. And within an hour or so, it would start to like, be absorbed because it's a straight amino acid. It doesn't have to go through a big digestion process. And I would start to feel like things were moving properly. If you don't have enough bile, it can affect all kinds of things, including how well the food's moving through your gut. And then there's Tudka, which has got a lot more press right now. It's sort of the new kid on the block. I don't know that I would go to Tudka unless you tried taurine and you didn't get good results because Tudka is going to cost you a lot more money. And I figure why not, why not play with, uh, you know, with a regular nutrient before you go to something like Tudka. But for me, I never actually have tried it because I never found that I needed it. Taurine was sufficient, but I have had some clients who their system was just really struggling and Tudka really helped. And so again, good liver support. So it's not just about the the uh, bile 
uh, in terms of something like tide kites, giving you other benefits as well. And I'll give, as I try to do, and and on James's anecdotal evidence of one and what I tried, many folks will know, and I'll be brief, that when I transitioned over from the vegan diet to eating meat again, I really struggled. I already knew that I had a sluggish gallbladder from years of the vegan diet, plus I had two cysts in there. They wanted it out. I refused to at the time. Glad that I Glad that I did that. I also had very low stomach acid, so where I started was using betaine HCL to get that stomach acid up from the beginning to help break down the food. Then I added in ox bile, as you you suggested, and I also tried tutka um, because I had very sluggish uh, bile flow, and tutka helps thin that bile out, as you know, and get things moving. Because I struggled with constipation severely. What I have found with folks, because I get a ton of questions, and today I must have had four questions on on digestion. So I'm glad we're covering. Is that obviously, you know, if you have low stomach acid, you begin there because that's where our digestive process starts. You want to kind of mimic how the body does it. Is that what I've found? And you always take your betaine HCL after your first bite of food, so you at least have some food in there. And you just don't take the acid right away. And then what I found very helpful is ox bile later, about an hour after the food, because the bile then sort of alkalizes your stomach acid and then helps your gallbladder secrete the bile, you know, as I mentioned, sort of uh, mimicking that natural digestive process. And it's been a godsend for me. And Tudka has also been very helpful in terms of getting that bile flow naturally for me. So thank you, Monique. That's super helpful. And, you know, I had never tried taurine. It'd be very interesting to try it at some time. Well, I mean, there are people for whom Tudka is the right thing to do, right? So, um, but but taurine has got a lot of really good benefits as well. And yeah, I think of it as the the little brother sort of to Tudka. So <laughs> excellent. This one should be a fairly quick one, and it kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier. It, it was a question from someone who asked, "Would sports like bodybuilding contribute to an increase in oxalate through muscle repair and collagen synthesis?" Yeah, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect that unless you don't have enough B6 available. If you, if you are in a lot of oxidative stress and you don't have enough B6 available, that's when you can be potentially producing more oxalate out of your metabolism, but normal function should not have you revving up your oxalate production unless you're really deficient in B6. Finally, for those that are metabolically unhealthy, and there's a lot of nuance to that question, being metabolically unhealthy, doesn't increase through the carnivore diet or or through supplementation in both glycine and hydroxyproline, does that lead to increased oxalate levels in the body? It could, again, if you don't have enough B6 on board. So I think the challenge for me with some of my carnivore clients would be that they hear, no, don't take supplements. No, you don't need supplements. No, just eat your diet um, or, you know, double down on meat. That'll, that'll make it better. And I think over the long haul, that's probably true because I take very few supplements now. And there was a point in time where my husband was making jokes about us opening up our own little drugstore, you know? And bless him that he put up with that part of the process because now I don't take a ton of things. And so the more nutrient dense your diet is and the lower in toxin that your diet is, the less likely that you need supplements. But is that true when we're first starting into this process and we've got a big backlog of work and we're we're in a lot of oxidative stress and there's things going on? No. So... It's, yeah, it's back to having some, you know, perspective on where you are in the process. So a healthy person doing bodybuilding and so on should not be expecting that somehow they're making extra oxalate. But if they've had a high oxalate diet, would it be smart for them to take maybe a even a low dose B complex to make sure that you're just ticking the boxes. They don't have any other issues or whatever. Yeah, maybe, or maybe take a little bit of certain supplements will have some B6 included. Like if they're taking, 
if they're taking a creatine product that's got a bunch of things in it, my daughter's taken up bodybuilding. She's got this creatine product. It's got all these things in it, right? Um, and there's a little bit of B6 in there. Great, right? Or maybe you make sure that you have something like liver, not as frequently as I did when I got gout. Or maybe you eat other kinds of, you know, higher B6 meat source right? Just to make sure that you've got enough so that when you're putting your body under this stress, it's got what it needs to handle the work that it's going to do. You know, that said, I would not go out of my way to take a collagen product, like where you've got isolated collagen, and you're going to take a big dose all at once. I think those kinds of things are different, right? And would I take a hydroxyproline kind of product? No, I probably wouldn't because I think that's different. Do I worry about it as a component of my steak, my chicken leg, my whatever? No, I don't. I don't. I don't think twice about it there. But we're also getting all kinds of cofactors in um, any whole food product. And in fact, one of the reasons I like to include pork in my diet is because it's higher in B1. Like every kind of meat has a different nutrient profile. There can be reasons to move around a bit. I just avoid over-focusing, let's say, on on these isolated components. And there I'm avoiding because I don't want to stimulate a lot of extra oxalate production. Because if I'm taking in a big dose of collagen, And it's sort of hitting my system all at once, this big dose of collagen. And then I don't have enough B6 on hand because it was an isolated collagen product. It's not got B6 in it, right? Then maybe I'm setting myself up for something. So I'm not a big fan of, yeah, some of these, the, the current new carnivore products that are out there where they have isolated something and then they say, oh, do this because, you know, be take collagen every day for four weeks and your skin's getting better. And I'm like, yeah. And in six months, where are you going to be? Like, I just, I worry about some of these longer term impacts that you can have, which you're not noticing at the beginning. And you and I both know this because I tried to become a vegan as well. And it took time before I went, this is not working. So it's, you don't always get an instant signal. So With something that's going to affect how you build your replacement parts, I would go very slowly, very carefully, and with a great deal of care, because that's different than a true signaling molecule. You get an immediate reaction after food, then you're talking histamine, or you're talking salicylate, you're talking something that can signal fast, but not everything can signal fast. Some things signal long and slow. Love it. Thank you for that, Monique. And just finally, before we end out, we had another question that was a big one. And I'd like to just preface it and tease it for our next episode a little bit, Monique. And it's it's a big one because there is so much detail and research on this. And it's it's so interesting to me. And the question was about oxalates and the intestines, how they could potentially contribute to increased absorption through intestinal permeability, fat malabsorption, which we t- talked about a little bit, inflammatory bowel condition, gluten sensitivity. That's a big one. And I'd just like to just give you a second to just talk about why it's so big. You know, when it comes to leaky gut, again, this is one of those things where everybody seems to have leaky gut. So it could be a chicken and egg thing. Oxalate's pro-inflammatory and we're revving it right up in our diet. So I wonder about that. But for sure, if the gut's leaky, if it's not able to keep out what it should keep out, that's a problem, right? If you've got, like people normally think of certain kinds of oxalate as being more absorbable than others. So soluble being more absorbable than insoluble. But if your gut's leaky, what if the insoluble is moving through too? Like we just have so many places here where we could talk because there's, there's different ways in which 
this could be contributing to problems for us, not just with oxalate. And people will say to me things like, well, if I get my leaky gut fixed, then I can eat oxalate again. And I'm like, what if oxalate's the thing that started you down this path to having a leaky gut? So yeah, I think there's, I think, I think I'd probably even make some slides up for you and kind of walk you through how some of that could all fit together. Cause the gut is a big factor here. Most of us are not becoming oxalate toxic because of cleaners, which would have happened in the past. Barkeep's friend has actually got a warning on it because you can, it's uses oxalate to clean. <laughs> so you don't want to use it without gloves on, right? Because you can be soaking it up through your hands. Um, but most of us are not dealing with oxalate that way. We're it, Ground zero is the gut. And there's just so much that you can be affecting from the mouth all the way through, because those are the first tissues that are being exposed to the oxalate that you're you're dealing with. And on that note, I'd like to say thank you again for taking the time out to do what you do, answer these questions. It is so great. I just love these conversations because as you so eloquently put to me in a message and, and to to others the other day on, on Twitter, is it that it leads us into thought-provoking things, these questions asked from our listeners and you taking the time out. And folks, I just want to let you know, I do the easy part and I just collect the, the questions from the listeners. Monique takes these questions away, puts them in such an order that, that they flow, and then does the research to be able to answer your questions. And we're so grateful to you, Monique. Thank you for doing it. Thank you. Oh, well, this is, this is my passion. This is, this is the best work ever. If I can be part of the people who get this word out, who help other people be healthy, like that changes everything. Because then if you've got a person who's healthy and well, and is a good parent and a, and a contributor to society. And like, there's just, it's so big. It's like our health really is such a fundamental piece of what we're going to contribute to this world. Without it, we, our contribution kind of becomes smaller. I'd love to see people be able to make the biggest contribution that they've got. Like, why shouldn't life be a grand adventure? And so it's certainly been for me because yeah, I was 48, thought I'd die before my kids grew up. Now I'm 63, just had my birthday in September. And yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to be doing this forever. Like if I can still be telling people and helping people get well and, and live, you know, their biggest life when I'm at 95, I'll be, I'll be doing it. And we're going to appreciate you every step of the way for what you've done and what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Monique. I don't know if we're going to get the opportunity again to chat before the crazy holiday season is upon us, but I want to wish you and your family the very best in the upcoming holiday season and for the new year. I look forward to having another conversation as soon as we can. Thank you again for taking the time out. It's been an absolute pleasure and an honor. No, it's been wonderful as usual, James. I I said to you in a in a message as we were setting up for this, and it's true. Some sometimes you meet people and it's like old friends. And so this this is great. This is my favorite way to do an interview where I'm I'm have I'm being interviewed by an old friend. <laughs> Thank you so much. That means so much to me, Monique. Have a wonderful rest of your day. You too. And that's a wrap on this episode of Carnivorous Chats. If you've made it this far, I want to say thank you for listening and also thank you in advance for liking, subscribing, or sharing this episode. Thanks again to Equip Foods, Carnivore Snacks, and the Carnivore Bar. Don't forget to check the link in the show notes to get a discount on their products. Until the next time, be well 